I now have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker. Last year at this meeting, Dr. Brink announced the launch of the ACR Data Science Institute, an effort to put radiologists at the forefront of developing tools to effectively guide the introduction of artificial intelligence in clinical imaging practice. Dr. Keith Dreyer serves as Chief Data Science and Information Officer at Mass General Hospital and also at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. He also chairs the ACR Commission on uh, Informatics. Dr. Dreyer lends a uh, sage and visionary voice to the topic of artificial intelligence in medical imaging. Please welcome Dr. Dreyer to the stage. Thank you very much. And uh, Alan, thanks for the great plug-in on uh, AI. Uh, the one thing I learned, I always learn from Alan, I think if I want an applause, I just go like this. <laughs> well, I get, I get laughter, he gets applause. Um, what, what Alan did a great job of, and I didn't even see it coming, was the why of artificial intelligence. So I, I hope uh, you kind of got that message clear, because I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the why. I think, I think we're there. Uh, but I do want to show you the what and the how. So I'll talk about um, what's going on in the industry, and then even further is what's going on at the ACR with the Data Science Institute. Um, if you look at data science, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, these are the areas uh, that the terms are being used today uh, to define data science. I'll dive in just a little bit. You know, back in the 60s, 70s, 50s, artificial intelligence was the term. That's the robot that's going to come in and take over from lost in space. Uh, machine learning came in later, and then deep learning now, because the massive compute and the massive depth of data that's around, uh, you can do much more deeper inference, and that's what's necessary for things like uh, AI in our field. So if you've uh, read journals or read any of the articles that have come out in the last few years, uh, the question is, it's just so sensationalized, is this hype or is this reality? And like most things, most new things, it's probably a little bit of both. And so I want to try and tease some of that out for you, give you some information, and let you make your own opinions on that. If you look at the AI technology itself and, and how it is to, able to do all of this, uh, think of just simple questions that you would ask, say like a child, or as, as you learn, can you, I'll ask you, can you define the pictures that have mountains in them here? So it seems like you could, clearly the two on the left do, clearly the two in the middle don't, but what about a desert with mountains? What about this Ayers Rock in the middle of Australia? Is that a mountain or not? Well, that's for you to decide. And as you're teaching a child, that's what you'd have to do. So as you teach computer, you have to do the same thing. So let's say we just check off, and the expert, the, the ground truth, as we call it, the expert, the human, has to define exactly what this is during the training time. So that's what I've done. Now I have thousands of pictures of mountains, thousands of pictures that are not mountains. I run them through this kind of empty brain or neural network. And when I do that, I wind up with an accuracy as the, the uh, algorithm learns and learns and learns off of those images, it then creates this model, what's called an inference model, that gets to a certain accuracy. And then it's shown that, in this case, 93% accurate to be able to detect mountains inside of images, mountain ranges, as you've defined it. So now I can apply this algorithm to brand new pictures that it's never seen before, and when I do that, it comes back and gives me a percent likelihood of mountains being in that image. In this particular case, the one in the middle, it said, not mountains. The other two, yes, mountains. So you set a threshold, and you say, above that, I have a mountain. Below that, I don't have mountains. Now, this isn't science fiction anymore. If you pull out your smartphone, a Samsung, a Pixel, uh, an iPhone, you'll be able to actually type in mountain, and you'll be able to see all the pictures that you've taken of mountains. So we're here today. If I showed this three years ago, we weren't here yet. Now we're here today. That's how fast this uh, field is evolving. So let's just recap what they did or what we did to be able to identify mountains, because this is going to be the same thing in our field. So this development cycle for our artificial intelligence, the first thing you need to do is come up with what it is you're going to do. In this particular case, we decided to make the ability to identify mountains inside of images. That's our use case. That's the term I'm going to use again and again. Uh, so think of it, use case, as defining why I'm doing this, what I'm trying to do. Next, I have to do what's called data engineering. I have to find thousands and thousands of images and then actually label them as mountains or not mountains and decide whether I want to include desert mountainscapes, large rocks, uh, things that are combinations of valleys and lakes and rivers. And so that data engineering, that annotation process, results in what I call AI data. That data is now smarter than it was before you did that work. 
Then you apply the data science. This is the stuff that everyone talks about, the neural networks, uh, convolutional neural networks, all of those kind of things is the component that then you run, the algorithm runs itself. It takes, it used to take months and months to try and get a computer to do this. Now it can do it in hours or minutes because of the massively available computation. And then you actually make an application. In this case, the application was in the phone. It could be on a website. It could be built into a camera. Uh, but then that gets deployed. So it's that four-step process, the idea, the data engineering, the data science, and then the application itself. So what is the impact that this is having on society as a whole? If you think about our hardware, how long it took humans to develop the hardware that we have today inside of our brains, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years, if not millions of years, to be able to do that. If you look at computational capabilities that are coming equal to these biological systems, it's done that in about 70 years. So naturally, this curve is going to probably exceed the capabilities that we see inside of biological systems in the near future. Uh, don't get scared from that because there's a lot more required to be able to do, to be able to think and compute and do, and I'll show you more of the challenges around that. But I think it's fair to say that computation is coming up to the compute capabilities of biology. And also, though, what's important is when calculators came out, uh, accountants didn't go away. They just used calculators. In fact, they were probably involved in the creation of calculators because they were the purchasers of them. It's going to be very similar in our field. So it's going to be a human and machine integration a consolidation that's going to take place probably in many of these areas like self-driving cars or self-flying planes. There's still folks that are in there interacting with those autonomous systems. So where is AI being used? As I mentioned, autonomous cars. Uh, if you talk to Jensen Wang, the CEO of NVIDIA, who was really at the cornerstone of creating these autonomous vehicles, um, they spent about $5 billion just to create the bedrock, the cornerstone of what's necessary to go on the cars to start to actually create the technology there. So there's a massive ingestion of dollars that's required to make these things happen in a specific segment, in a narrow area like autonomous vehicles. Uh, there's now, as of this year, uh, AI in your oven. So June Intelligent Oven can actually look to see what you put in the oven from a camera above, shows you on your iPhone, and tells you exactly how to bake it. And if you didn't like it, it can modify it. It goes back to the web. It records and reports all this stuff. So now you have an AI-driven oven. There's also AI in your suitcase now, as of the Consumer Electronics Show from this year. So the Indiegogo Travel Mate actually follows you around. It knows who you are. It knows how to follow you wherever you go. Uh, it can hop onto the little walkways with you. And it can even put items on top of it to carry them for you. Uh, there's AI, as I mentioned, AI in your phone, so now I could type in something like Chihuahua and I can see all the pictures of Chihuahuas that I've taken. Now, there's challenges with this, though. This isn't perfect. Just like humans, this is not going to come out perfect. And if you just look at examples of, of dogs, of the artificial intelligence that runs on dogs, trying to identify pictures of dogs, here's just some examples where things don't go so well. So this is a Chihuahua. Uh, and it recognized it as such. But it's amazing how blueberry muffins look just like chihuahuas <laughs> to a computer. Here's a Commodore. This is no surprise what's going to come out here, right? A bunch of mops. <laughs> so they all thought these were dogs. And another example is the Golden Doodle, one of my favorite dogs that looks exactly like a piece of fried chicken. <laughs> so uh, it's not perfect, just like us. We're not perfect. So let's look at healthcare opportunities here specifically. So how do you go from creation to implementation of AI technology inside of a hospital today? How do you put massive compute, either indirectly, virtually, or inside of a hospital on premises? And, and specifically to us, how do we do that inside of a department of radiology? So if you remember or are familiar with imaging 3.0, great. If not, let me just step you through what I think, how I think of what we do inside of our departments and as radiologists most every day. So in the radiology information cycle, someone is taking care of a patient. Someone needs to figure out what to do, and can I use a diagnostic tool inside of imaging that's going to help me, and I place an order. I then I have to be able to protocol or actually kind of clean up that order. What are they really looking for? What's the information that I can deliver back? How do I optimize the exam so that the acquisition time is spent appropriately optimizing the information that comes back? So that's the exam. Then the imaging itself. We kind of take this for granted that a, so a patient goes into a box and the images come out. But if you have artificial intelligence, it's kind of like that oven. I can now really change things on the fly as I'm starting to look at the baking process or I'm starting to look at images and information coming out on the patient. Why should I have to wait till later and have the patient come back? 
I can have artificial intelligence work instantaneously and modify the pulse sequences, modify the acquisitions so that I can change that and optimize it, not just for the patient, but for the pathology or potential pathology inside that patient on the fly. The data then comes out, and then here's the part that a lot of people are working on today, the interpretation process. That, that which we do uh, when we see the data and we want to inform the clinicians as to what additional things they need to do or to be concerned about. So all these four areas are fair game for artificial intelligence. And if you've gone to conferences in the last nine months, uh, heavily shown at RSNA uh, last year, and also shown um, at uh, ECR in just a couple months ago in March in Vienna, uh, companies are creating interpretation artificial intelligence components, things that happen at the point of interpretation, or stepping back during image acquisition, showing things that you can actually do at scan time just prior to or inside of the scanner itself. And then things you can do pre-acquisition, say lining up priors. Why should you do an exam and then try and match it to the priors? If you could actually have the computer see the priors, maybe it could optimize the exam so that now you're comparing apples to apples, as an example. And then clinical care. All this work that we're doing with decision support and driving it through appropriateness criteria, it's not going to be very far from now where artificial intelligence will be guiding that clinical decision support process or guiding population health management with the massive amounts of data that we create inside of our imaging facilities uh, to guide patient care even before the thought of how to order imaging is necessary. So that's the information cycle. Now that, let's match that up with when I showed you mountains, that AI development cycle, right? So now we have these AI concepts, data engineering, the same kind of uh, talked about data science, and now these will be AI, clinical AI applications that we need to deploy. So if you think about the interpretation process, that's clearly us, we're the experts, we're the, the center of ground truth. In imaging, it's probably us again, with technologists, with physicists, with industry. Uh, when we look at protocols, it's probably us again. All those things that we need to figure out what we need to do, can we tell industry the, the tools that we need for them to create for us to be smarter, faster, more efficient? And then finally, clinical care, it's probably a combination of us with our subspecialty clinicians that are ordering the exams to help them guide through the process of when is imaging appropriate, when's pathology appropriate, when's nothing appropriate, when's genetics and genomics. That's a big role that we need to play and participate with that. So these are the specialists. These are the folks that are gonna determine the mountains or determine the areas of interest and in how to define the ground truth to make that data engineering, data science, and applications truly work. Without these folks, this won't work. So computation, let me just step back a little bit. That computation curve that took off for those 70 years happened on the backs of humans. Humans with fingers on keyboards, programmers. Programmers created all the technology that you see here today, but that's changing rapidly. So in the future, it'll be general AI. You can imagine a robot that learns just like a newborn, walks around, sees the world, starts to figure things out, and starts to interact. That's not here today. What's here today is what's called narrow AI. So you say, I'm going to look for mountains inside of a picture. I'm going to look for nodules inside a CT. I'm going to narrow this down so that I can actually accomplish the problem. And then you use the data itself to actually program the computer to be able to come up with these answers. But we're in such a uh, early stage, a nascent stage of artificial intelligence that we really have to focus that problem to get it to be near human performance. So that's these use cases. If we don't get these use cases right, we're not going to have functioning AI. So let's take that case of interpretation, right? What is it that that radiologist does at that point? What are those narrow AI solutions that are happening inside the neurons of, of the human? that does this. Well, we've broken our specialties down into organ systems or subspecialties. We also have the benefit of having multiple modalities. So all of these kind of cross over. Within those, anatomical representation is completely different and we have to become accustomed and familiar with that. Our brains are learning continuously to be able to adapt for these changes. And then beyond that are the findings. Findings of normal, findings of normal variants, findings of early pathology, late stage pathology, all of that information are these narrow AI bandwidths. And there's thousands and thousands of these that we learn as we learn radiology. And this is what we're going to be asking artificial intelligence to do if we wanted to have it help us do interpretation. So let's just focus in one area so I can drill down a little bit. Let's look at MSK, MR. Within that, let's look at knee. And within that, let's look at posterior cruciate, cruciate pathology, tear. So now, inside of this, we say, let's draw an ROC curve. Let's take just some average radiologists and we'll say, where is their ROC curve? A 
okay, they're better than a random guess, let's make a pretty good one or better, rad B, and then rad C is somebody who's really good at being able to find a PCL tear. You could look at any other area, any other finding that you want to do, and you'll see kind of a distribution, something similar to this. The question is, do we need artificial intelligence to be phenomenal, better than all humans? What if it's just kind of in here better than many radiologists? Is it still a tool that could be used? How would you commercialize that? How would you make that available to us? What would it do for us? These are the questions that we all need to answer with industry, and industry is waiting for us to guide them through this process. But in this particular case, here's a bell-shaped curve of the worst radiologist to the best radiologist in this ability to detect PCL tear. And here's AI in its ideal state, but here's AI maybe in its realistic state. So you're still solving a problem to all those people in the bell-shaped curve to the left. Is that a solution that could be deployed? You could even ask that differently and say, how do I focus it? How do I make it better? How do I make it like AI star star? Well, you can narrow that AI, narrow AI. So if you say, I'm only going to look at certain patient demographics. I'm only going to look at the certain pathology of tear, like yes, no tear instead of partial tear. Uh, if you focus on just certain pulse sequences and train it for that, or just anatomic planes like axial, or certain equipment manufacturers, or certain fit signal strength, you can wind up with higher accuracy, but it will only be working in a certain narrow, narrow area. So these are all the questions that industry is asking and waiting for us to help answer those questions. But that just solves one problem. You could then say, let's look at all MR, or let's look at uh, MSK of all, all MR, or MSK through all modalities, or absolutely everything. And I hope you can see there's thousands of these challenges, thousands that we need to be able to help industry create, and then we also have to consume those as the purchasers of this technology, taking thousands of these solutions and putting them inside of our systems in some organized fashion. So that's interpretation, right? So this is what it would look like. We'd have that expert or an expert panel, a group of people say, here's how you define the use case for PCL tears. We need to know these three degrees of tear because this one goes to surgery, this one uh, doesn't, et cetera, et cetera. Then data engineering would construct at various places, at premises like your facilities or ours, um, you can actually create these data sets, and then the data science would run, and an application gets created. So now you could imagine that that person that wanted to have that tool is now available for them in a consistent and standard way. So the challenges of healthcare AI, and they're large. This is early in the field. Uh, so trying to transfer something from the internet, recognizing faces into our space to recognize uh, anatomy off of cross-sectional cross imaging is not without its challenges. So while there are promising publications and initial applications that you read about probably quite frequently, there's currently a limited use of AI in clinical care. And again, we're only a few years in, only a few things have been through FDA approval, but what does the future, the near-term future look like and why is it not moving faster? So some possible reasons for this would include limitations to the current human AI interface. And I use the case of saying, if I created an autonomous vehicle and it was on a Tesla, great, because it's kind of already designed to be deeply electronic. But if I tried to put that in an old car, like a 55 Chevy, you'd never have the electronics to do it, so you'd have to have a handheld, probably an iPhone while you're driving, that's not gonna go so well. That's kind of what we're asking today inside a lot of the systems that we have. It may be also why CAD before, even though it wasn't as accurate, it might also be why it was failing before, because the integration and the interfaces weren't there. There's currently also no successful economic business model. So the Data Science Institute next week in DC have invited a number through a seminar, a number of uh, industry uh, folks that are in AI to talk through exactly what this is. What does the economic business model look like uh, because most folks, even large companies that are in this space, have no idea about our payment system, payment reform systems. So uh, that, this is another uh, rate limiting step. Even more so, these large annotated training sets that are required, those thousands or tens or hundreds of thousands of images, are difficult to extract for a variety of reasons and to label those. There's no standards for clinical integration, so we all probably have different healthcare infrastructure systems, and so it's very difficult to have dozens if not hundreds of algorithms connect into those things today. And I think the number one is that clinically effective use cases, those specific use cases for AI have been poorly defined because there hasn't been a need to do this yet, but now there's a dire need to be able to define what these are. So let's drill down a little bit on that. If you look at lung cancer screening as just another example, so we're in thoracic imaging inside of CT, and we, let's say we're going to look for pulmonary nodules, and that's our narrow AI challenge. That's our use case, right? 
So one of the things we looked at were three FDA-approved models to be able to identify pulmonary nodules. And so their job is to actually see a brand new image and do inference and actually extract out nodule definition, nodule description one, here's from the second algorithm, and here's from the third algorithm. And so you would think all of these would be describing the same nodule. Absolutely not. They weren't. They weren't even describing the nodules with the same methodology. They weren't saying the same descriptors of these nodules because there was no use case to tell them how to do that. So vendors working independently had to think of this all on their own. So for us to be able to consume them becomes quite challenging. So if you look at this particular case, let's take that expert, that use case definer away, because in this case there wasn't one. And so now you have no use case, and so three different groups created three different solutions for identifying pulmonary nodules. They used three different data science algorithms and created three different applications. And now that poor radiologist or clinician that has to be able to see this is looking at three different solutions. So if they buy one, two years later they buy another one, patient data is changing, or if they get an upgrade it's changing, and even the way that they have to report out is different. So it's very complicated and it's not ideal as to the way that you'd want to be able to expand a rapidly scaling uh, um, a technology like this. So if you put that radiologist or a group of radiologists at the center of defining the concepts, and let's say they define that use case, now you have a focused way to define the data engineering, a focused way to use the data science and an application that will now give you a single solution. Multiple vendors can create them, they can compete, but you have a single solution. So I hope you can see that there's a need for this kind of coordination that just doesn't exist in the field today. And this is where one of the aspects of the Data Science Institute comes forward. It's in advancing data science solutions for radiological care that are clinically relevant, safe, and effective. And we do so by an advisory board, AI panel chairs of the different domains, the subspecialties, and senior scientists in the domains orthogonal to those subspecialists. So suffice it to say, a lot of clinicians, a lot of radiologists, a lot of members that are engaged in this process. And one of the focuses, obviously, is use cases, but there's many other things, uh, like ethics and legal and education, that are necessary to be able to keep this moving in the right direction, oftentimes that industry doesn't have time uh, to be able to pay attention to. Let's focus inside the use cases, though. So if we were to do this pulmonary nodule thing, why wouldn't we use lung rats? We've defined lung rads and actually able to make recommendations and classifications on actions that are necessary to take based on studies that have been done and performed. And so you would want to be able to have the use case be something that would populate lung rads in conjunction with the radiologists. So in this particular case, we would use lung rads as the use case. Anybody can then train up that data to say cancer, no cancer, lesions, no lesions, classification of lung rads by uh, using lung rads itself. You can run the algorithms and create multiple applications, but now these are all interchangeable. So you could swap out between those and still have consistent data representation. Some may be more accurate, as time will actually prove that things get better and better, but you won't have to start over when you make the switch. So this is what it would look like. You have data that's being trained because you're using lung rads when you're dictating, so now you could use that data to actually train the algorithm. And when you do, uh, commercialization, you could license it, you could use it internally, Patient comes in, new CT hasn't been seen, you run the algorithm, the findings are detected, quantified, populated into the lung rad scoring system inside your reporting system, make changes, modifications to that as the radiologist agree, disagree, and now you've got the same course of action as if you read the case that you may have been assisted now by uh, artificial intelligence. And the key here is now, if you change the algorithm because three years later there's a better one, and you change it again, you don't have to change all the workflow, the recommendations, you don't have to retrain uh, clinicians as to what the numbers mean, you just stay consistent with the processes but you're changing out the algorithm. This is critical. So in doing this also, you can have this solution provided to you inside the scanner, as I mentioned. You could have it on premises inside of a computer. You could even use it virtually through a cloud through secure access to moving your data around. It's really independent of that. The other key is that as the radiologist is making changes, so all radiologists in the country, let's say, are working with these algorithms, changing them to make them more accurate at times, now you have access through the registry, you can pull back all that information. So you can see what the algorithms are doing, see what they're, how they're working on specific patients, specific scanners, certain radiologists, certain locations, where you couldn't do this otherwise. 
That could inform the people that are actually creating the use cases. It could inform the manufacturers that there's a problem with their algorithm in a certain location, or it's too narrow, it's too brittle. And you could also inform the regulatory agencies because they have no way to do post-FDA approval um, surveillance. So just like LungRAD solves a problem like that, you can imagine looking at this entire space just for interpretation. There are other low-hanging fruit that you could create use cases for, which is exactly uh, what's happening inside of the Data Science Institute. So the services that are being provided uh, are these use case panels that are actually defining uh, by subspecialty organizations, much similar to the appropriateness criteria panels, actually defining these use case panels. And this is being under the guidance of uh, Bib Allen, the chief medical officer of the Data Science Institute. If you look at the data engineering that's required, so we're, we, the ACR, are not going to actually bring in images and start to do annotations on them to create algorithms, but we need to help to make sure that people can do this in the consistent and correct way. So making services available for them to author uh, and you folks to be able to author uh, content, the data that you have, to make it have more value. And then data science itself, when data scientists are actually creating these algorithms, they have to make sure that they're valid, not just in the facility that they created it in, but everywhere across the country or across the globe. And so one of the things that we also feel is necessary, and that we've had a number of discussions with the FDA, and they champion our efforts in this space, and it's helpful for them as well, is to create a certification process for these algorithms. And this is to assess the algorithm's performance, specifically defined by the use case. Are you meeting the uh, agenda or the activities required inside the use case. And we're doing this tested on embargoed data sets that wouldn't have been seen before. It's almost like taking the boards. You can't be examined on images or cases you know. Uh, you have to be, see things for the first time. Uh, multiple readers will guide the ground truth. And also, it's important that uh, we protect the developer's intellectual property and ensure patient privacy, but also reduce bias of these sample sets and demonstrate that there is no bias uh, by the population that they chose. Uh, finally, the application component is important, so to be able to guide folks, guide uh, industry into deploying this into our facilities is critical. So we have ACR Assist, I'll touch on that for a second, uh, it's been around for a while. The registries, so we have an AI registry, and then finally Assess AI, where we can assess the value of artificial intelligence as it gets deployed. Assist is this solution that basically takes like a RADS, like lung RADS, LIRADS, thyrads and be able to integrate it into your workflow, into your reporting system, so now you can consistently enter in the information and get consistent results back for classification and recommendations. Well, when artificial intelligence starts to slowly step into the space, it can populate that for you, show you, and let you interact like that example I showed with lung rats. So that tool can also populate the registry because it has structured information that comes out. So just like we have connected facilities for accreditation or other uh, dose metrics or for other registries, this registry is the same way connected to those facilities to move the information up. Then we use Assess to be able to give information, as I mentioned, back to the institutions for benchmarking of these algorithms, to, for developers to show the analytics of how well they're working in the wild, and then finally regulators for surveillance metrics. So you can see this is the components that are necessary that are just not available inside the industry today to keep it moving. So the Data Science Institute is really focusing on this interdis interdisciplinary approach between healthcare and specifically imaging and that broad field of computation and informatics like Alan said that we really need to own or we need to be very, very familiar uh, with and responsible for and particularly as you step out into the areas like data engineering, data science uh, and application integration interfacing. We really need to be deeply involved in that process and help to facilitate that through vendors. So in summary, I hope I've shown that AI will dramatically change healthcare. There's no doubt radiology is at the forefront of this revolution. Like it or not, we're here again, so we might as well step up and run this thing. Uh, industry has really shown that artificial intelligence works phenomenally well on images on the internet. So similarly, images inside of healthcare will probably go first. I think professional societies such as our own must organize this industry, and I hope I've helped to demonstrate that. And finally, the combination of humans and AI clearly is the future. This is what it's probably going to look like pictorially inside of a department, maybe in uh, 2038. Um, you're, instead of just reading off the images directly, they'll go to some sort of cloud somewhere, and findings will be displayed. It'll go deeper and bring in genetics and genomics from the patient. And with that, it'll maybe make some recommendations and guidance. 
It could almost uh, create the visualization or preparation, preparation of information for you to be able to review, bringing in far more information than just the image data. It could, you could then construct a report out of that or work with it to create it. That would be your interpretation. It probably won't change much. But additionally, you'll have structured recommendations. And beyond that, you could have AI quantified findings that are coming out of our images that are available today, but a lot of human labor would be required. And so I, this is, I think, this future for digital health and how we get engaged. And it's going to be for all of the components, all of the modalities that we do. And the hope is that we will be able to be more engaged, not just with the information component, but with the human components to be able to have time to have the interaction, describe and define exactly what it is we're doing with not just the imaging data, but this massive amount of imaging data, of information data that's happening and growing in healthcare today. And if you're concerned about uh, being taken over by computers, I would I love this quote from 1965, a NASA report advocating manned spaceflight. And the quote was, man is the lowest cost, 150 pound, all-purpose computer system, which can be mass-produced by unskilled labor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And I see, I see an empty stage, so I think we're done. <laughs>